welcome to yet another edition of Expressions uh, with the New Indian Express. We have uh, the wonderful Dushyan Sridhar with us today, uh, Indic speaker, author, storyteller, a man who makes our epics come alive uh, through his discourses. I'm really looking forward to listening to him. And we have Dr. S. Vaidya Subramaniam, who's the Vice Chancellor of Shastra Deemed University, a very uh, erudite man in his own uh, um, uh, esteem. But of course, uh, today, uh, I think we're both going to be uh, playing the role of listeners and uh, an enraptured audience as uh, uh, Dushyanti speaks. But over to you, uh, Dr. Veda, because you know uh, Dushyanti much better, I think, than I do. So please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kaveri. Uh, and uh, namaste to Dushyant. Uh, wonderful to again see you all through this uh, virtual medium for this uh, session of uh, expressions that's uh, brought to you by, by the New Indian Express group. Uh, I'm extremely happy to share the screen uh, uh, for a change because I've been sharing the stage with Mr. Dushyant for quite a number <laughs> of times and today we are sharing the screen together and uh, I'm extremely happy to be a part of this uh, conversation which is uh, titled Realization Pathway. So it's a wonderful uh, topic that's uh, getting us into the, uh, uh, taking us through a different pathway where we have realized that uh, this uh, COVID, uh, which is for the last two and a half months, uh, uh, turning things upside down. Uh, we have been wondering actually uh, what to do in the future uh, how, how do we actually recollect what we did in the past and how we are handling the present? So it's a kind of a combination of uh, feelings of individuals and institutions. Uh, and in the process, uh, we have realized that there is a lot of, uh, you know, a uh, set of values that we have uncorked, uh, be it at the individual level or at the institutional level. So we, we are also mindful of the fact that uh, a great country like ours, uh, the civilizational continuum that we have had, it's because that we cherish certain civilizational assets. The bedrock of those uh, civilizational assets or the Indic values that we uh, hold it very close to our heart. So I would just uh, try to begin this session by requesting Dushyant to give us by way of an opening remark for the next 10 to 15 minutes on shaping the contours of the discussion forward as to how these values uh, have uh, shaped the way in which individuals think and behave, the way in which institutions think and behave. And uh, during this period, we also saw the uh, Ramayana and Mahabharata in the TV. So I'm sure he will draw some examples from that as well. Besides other uh, ancient wisdom through scriptures, how all of this have been able to realize, uh, make us realize that fundamentally the underlying current that defines institutional and individual values have a very strong bondage with our Indic assets. So that will form the uh, opening remarks of uh, Dushyant, after which uh, maybe I will engage with him with uh, three or four questions and then take a few audience questions before we uh, wrap up. So the duration for this entire event is going to be for uh, 90 minutes. And over to you, uh, Mr. Dushyant. Please uh, leave the audience enlightened in a style that is uniquely and characteristically yours. Over to Mr. Dushyant. My uh, namaskarams to the both of you, uh, Kaveriji and uh, Vaidya. And of course, to the wonderful meeting that has been uh, arranged for a very global audience. But now that even I am getting used to a very fixed audience in front of my screen, um, uh, I, 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 I wouldn't even let the both of you even scratch your nose. I'm just going to keep looking at your faces. <laughs> um, uh, we, uh, the word in Sanskrit for capturing or grasping or catching hold of something is grahanam. In, in Hindi also, we use the word grahan. And uh, now is the period today, this day, we are caught between two grahanams. We were just done with a lunar eclipse recently. 
and on the 21st of june we will be coming across a solar eclipse so we are caught between two grahanams right. so one is a chandra grahanam one is a surya grahanam and uh, we are blessed with the sun's rays and the moon's uh, nectarine rays every day so as uh, vaidya uh, wanted me to uh, put forth some realization or probably some points that have dawned my way one uh, as a person who has been a fan a follower and to some extent a critique as well of the indic civilization uh, that we have uh, bequeathed or we have uh, inherited um, i have wondered at the uh, process of we visiting a temple so right from my childhood days beat in the days of chennai bangalore or even bombay where i worked for some time whenever i would visit a temple that follows a certain agama uh, uh, science uh we would be offered the holy water it's called the tirtham so i used to wonder the priest used to offer the water thrice he used to offer it once the second time and the third time and he knew based on the uh the metro's water availability will the proportion of the water given to me also vary and that have spent quite a considerable time in chennai i would know that they will even go to very very uh, abysmally very low levels nevertheless it used to be given thrice and uh, as a person who was uh, inquisitive about knowing answers to these steps i would ask why and uh, the preceptor my acharya who taught me the science of vedanta used to say each time he gives you it is to draw or take away the evil effects of three kinds of uh, worries that an individual is bound to face one is called adhyatmika second is called adi daivika third is adi bhautika it has been said in our scriptures that there are ag- there is agony to an individual be it to kaveri be it to vaidya to anybody in the audience or be it to me based on what my body and my mind has to offer so if my mind is clear i'm fine else i will have problems because of it there are some miseries caused by those creatures that are around me for example uh, if you ask people who live in the villages of kerala or in the borders of tamil nadu they will say every day our fields are trampled by elephants and then they are destroyed by wild boars so you will have problems caused by creatures and the third comes when there is a natural disaster i am sure india has been uh, a very very strong survivor to many many disasters like the tsunami the earthquake and so on now uh to drive away the effects of all this is what you call it as three times you offer water adhyatmika adi daivika and adi bhautika so i was wondering where corona fits in because uh it is not exactly caused by a tangible feature we can't see it through our naked eyes at the same time it is something like a big disaster to the world so and the depression that it causes in us it fits into every category so it's adhyatmika adi devika and adi bhautika that way corona is very very uh, unique a maverick in its own way probably an early second is because it's it fits into every category so if you ask about the realization that it has given us or probably to me or to the society on the whole two three levels that we can discuss one as an individual second as an institution earlier till about the pre corona period uh we have seen that individuals were empowering an institution so the parents and the students got together to empower the institution called the school or the college and uh, the employees of an organization put together came together and empowered the institution called the it consulting firm or a boutique consulting firm or an investment banking firm now we see the other way happening which is the institution is empowering the individuals so as a, 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 a son to a teacher my mother is a teacher i can tell you that uh, now she largely may depend on the students attending the online classes they taking the onus to sit for the entire period of one hour the parents also equally contributing to ensure that the child sits for that one hour so the triangle which is the student parent and the teacher relationship has kind of now leveled and um, if i have to talk about uh, the work from home concept because uh, i i was with the corporate career after i graduated from pilani for about 6 uh, and a half years 
So uh, work from home then was okay, but still my managers and my supervisors would say, see, once in a week is okay. See, you'll have to be, you'll have to show your face. You'll have to make yourself visible in the office. See, then only your appraisal will be guaranteed and you'll get the right quantum of bonus and sure you'll get a promotion. So the presence in the office more than the work, it was to ensure that the other person trusts me. But today we, we are not forced but we have to empower ourselves to trust the other individual that he will sit at home and he will work with full uh, dedication. And probably the best example that uh, Vaidya wanted uh, some anecdotes or some illustrations from our scriptures. Uh, when Bhagavad Gita begins, Bhagavad Gita begins on the first day of the Mahabharata Yuddham that happened for a series of 18 days. On the first day, uh, Dhritarashtra, the king who was the sovereign king who was ruling Hastinapura, he asked his driver, a charioteer, come advisor. So his name was Sanjaya. So he asked Sanjaya, uh, what's happening between my sons and Pandu's sons? So Bhagavad Gita doesn't begin with the questionnaire's name. It doesn't begin with Arjuna Vacha. It doesn't begin with Krishna's words, Bhagavan Vacha. It begins with Dhritarashtra Vacha. And Dhritarashtra asks, Dharma Kshetre, Kuru Kshetre, Samaveta, Yuyutsavaha, Mamaka Pandavas, Chaiva, Kimakuruvata, Sanjaya. What is it happening? And Sanjaya narrates what he sees from a distance. And it concludes with the concluding remarks of Sanjaya, who says, Yatra Yogeshwara Krishnaha, Yatra Partho Dhanurdharaha, Tatra Shri Vijayo Bhutir, Dhruvanitir, Matir Mama. So the point is, Dhritarashtra, who was very, very anxious about the survival of his sons, about the property and the wealth that they should be inheriting, was not present on the battlefield. He was not in the office. Let's assume battlefield is the office. He was not in the office then. He was not in that space then. But he had to trust the means of the knowledge getting dispensed, which is the technology, which is Sanjaya. So he completely relied on what Sanjaya said. And today, even today, our product called Bhagavad Gita is a concept of work from home. Had Dhritarashtra not asked and Sanjaya not answered, trust me, we would have never known what those 700 verses of Bhagavad Gita were. Because it was a very private conversation that happened between Krishna and Arjuna. And nobody was even 10 yojanas or 10 feet close. So Bhishma, in fact, was telling Duryodhana that Duryodhana, don't keep troubling me with questions because I am just waiting for that piecemeal of the wind that can carry at least one word of what they are speaking, but I'm not able to hear. So that's, that conversation was so private and confidential had it not been the technology then called Sanjaya. Let's, I'm not trying to put words like Wi-Fi and all that with Sanjaya, but Sanjaya was a means of dispensing knowledge from one corner to the other. So today, this COVID has made us realize that uh, trusting individuals is going to empower institutions. So individuals don't have to come together and empower an institution. If the institution trusts the individual, that is the first step. Now coming to, uh, I did quote about um, students' uh, education online, be it schools, middle schools or high schools, where parents also equally contribute because parents are initially anxious because they have to take the effort to make them sit, listen, and probably they have even started evaluating teachers because the parents get to know how good the teacher is mm -hmm. and they can always decrease or increase the quantum of the fees payment based on that. So uh, it works on the Boyle's Law concept. Nevertheless, here, uh, I do remember one example from Ramayana. Now that I've quoted Mahabharata, I'll just take up Ramayana because uh, the four sons, Girvanair, Arthyamano, Dashamukhanidaram, Kosaleesh, Krishyashunge, Putriya, Mishti, Mishtva, Dadushi, Dasharatakshma, Bhrite, Payasagriyam, Tad Bhuktva, Tad Purandhishvapi, Trishusasamam, Jatagar Bhasujato, Ramastvam, Lakshmanena, Svayamatha, Bharatena, Api, Shatrughna, Namna. These four sons of Dasharatha, be it Rama, Bharata, Lakshmana and Shatrughna. One thing that was very common was they never changed their school. So their tutelage was absolutely dedicated and assigned to one person called Vasishtha. So in those days, it was, it was called a pathantaram. Patha means lesson. So when you learn music or dance, it's always better to stick to one school of learning. Because the moment you start learning from three, four people, probably your music may get skewed. So Beit Rama and his other brothers who enjoyed a wonderful fraternity, they all learned that tutelage was under Vasishtha. 
Now, when a new system called Vishwamitra came in, he wanted Rama to be lent for six nights so that he could be the protector of his sacrifice. So he comes and asks, Swaputram Rajashardula Ramam Satya Parakramam Kakapaksha Dharam Veeram Jeshtham Me Datu Marhasi. Oh King, give me the uh, darkest of your sons. Probably if this were uh, the statement uttered in the US or Minneapolis these days, <laughs> probably it will even add more fuel to Floyd. But uh, as a country and a civilization, we have believed that black is beautiful. So most images in the south of India, the deities are black so much so that the devotees actually frown when they see uh, uh, the marble images. So we are so used to uh, the color black that we have, racism has never been our cup of tea. So um, the point here is, so he asks, give me the darkest of your sons. He says, Kaka Paksha Dharam Veeram. Dasharatha understands, but he's very skeptical. He says, uh, how can I send my son? He's the apple to my eye and he, my soul, my atma rests in him. That's when the original teacher called Vasishtha says, there's no harm in attempting and giving a chance to a new teacher, which is a new system of education. So today, if online teaching has been recommended as one of the modes to dispense knowledge, parents as well as institutions should not feel very nervous and should not feel wary about how the system is going to work because everything is a trial. Probably as a, uh, a country, Kaveri, you will appreciate this. We have had Sanskrit poets immensely from the times of Bhasa, Kalidasa, Maga, Bhartrihari, Bharavi, Dandi. Uh, 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 then we had Bhojaraja, we had Nilakantha Dikshita, Vedanta Deshika, many, many poets. They all have one thing to say in common. Don't discard something just because it seems new. Don't seem to blindly appreciate and accept just because something is old or ancient. If something is regarded old or ancient, you have the right to question it if you feel the questions should be asked. Something is new, if it is good, accept it. So if online mode of teaching is the order of the day, we have to openly and wholeheartedly support the system. At the same time, to blatantly conclude that this is the only way ahead is going to be a bit problematic. Because as human beings, we, of course, I need, even if I'm seeing Kaveri today, probably after six months, I would like to see her in person. I wouldn't just want to keep seeing the person just on my computer. This is also one mode of seeing. That is also one mode of seeing. So while the sons of Dasharatha, namely Rama and Lakshmana, were sent along with Vishwamitra, upon the recommendation of Vasishtha, Vasishthopi Mahatejaha, it is the acceptance of a new system of education. Now, another point that I would like to make is with respect to personal hygiene. See, while I used to work in Bombay, uh, and I used to have a group of friends who used to sit with me, uh, and we used to sit and eat, uh, they used to take their spoons and forks and used to put into my plates. And they would want to have the share, same share of food, but all of us were having the same channa and batura. So nothing would taste better in my plate. Nevertheless, uh, they would, you know, it's always that friendliness that brings in. But my only point even then, that was pre-corona period. And still I would say that I'm ready to share my piece of food with you at the start. But once you are tasting in your spoon, please don't put that spoon into mine. Not because, probably they may have a feeling that there is still untouchability in Dushan's mind. No. It was as simple as hygiene. So in those days, if I would tell my friends, they would say, hey, kya bakra hai tu? Now, even washed plates of somebody else, we don't want to use. <laughs> so we have reached that stage. In Tamil, Kaveri, there is a saying, Vecha kudumi saracham mutta. Which means, uh, which generally implies you take extremes of position. So you either say, I will have food with everybody anywhere, or now we have landed in a situation where we say that I wouldn't even drink in the same tumbler in which you're drinking. So we have, so I think we need to maintain that balance. Probably as a civilization, when the country has evolved, it is over a period of time that it gets embellished. So our set of practices, our set of thoughts, everything adds value to it. And it may change and get polished over a period of time. So we, we can accept the certain practices of the past, make some amends to it, and try to coin a new version, probably 
uh, one of the stars, Rajni Khan, will like this. So we can have a 2.0 to all these practices. <laughs> so we need to have versions to it. And one thing that I would want to conclude, because uh, I think uh, we'll have a discussion after this. One thing that I would like to conclude is, uh, how do we care about nature? So when we are zoology and botany students, we often refer to them as flora and fauna. So there is a plant kingdom. There is an animal kingdom. So I'm including everything that's reptiles also under animal kingdom. I'm not getting into the phylum, cilium, terata, anilida, arthropoda, and all that. It just says flora and fauna. So how can we as individuals be considerate towards it? See, uh, it's often cited or probably misconceived or misinterpreted that Sanatana Dharma, which is today in most application forms written as Hinduism, has been very, very strict and made vegetarianism mandatory. It is a very, very misinterpreted statement because vegetarianism has never been made mandatory in Sanatana Dharma. So we have had Kshatriyas who have had their fair share of meat after hunting. So probably you can put like this, if one aspires to a uh, better spiritual realm, then uh, vegetarianism may be recommended so there are certain communities who have made it a habit to not consume, but there are certain communities who are absolutely allowed. And in fact, two examples, one from Mahabharata, where uh, we have one person called Dharma Vyadha. The only duty of this person was to dispense what the nuances of Dharma is. And he was the butcher in a country called Videha Desha. And as he used to cut pieces of meat, Vyasa, and other rishis used to stand in a queue to get their doubts cleared. So uh, that is one. Second thing, when Rama manages to kill the monkey king of Kishkinta called Vali, Vali has a volley of questions to ask. He asks Rama, just because your wife has been kid kidnapped or abducted, it doesn't mean out of frustration you can kill anybody you see. And I happen to be a monkey. And if you would justify stating that you're a kshatriya who's allowed to hunt, please consider this, Rama. Uh, an elephant is generally poached or hunted for ivory. Certain animals for their, for their hide. Certain animals for the flesh. I don't fall into the flesh category because I'm sure whatever best of the cuisines you make with monkey flesh, I'm sure you, it's not going to taste good. I don't have ivory. I don't have the nails to make ornaments of. I have nothing in me. What have you, why have you killed? So he says one statement in Ramayana. Pancha panchanakaha bhakshya. Shastras have said that five, five nailed five animals alone can be consumed by non-vegetarians. I as a monkey don't fall into this category. Why did you kill? So this <clears throat> conversation have brought it into picture because ultimately our care for nature has been very, very minimal. Whether we would like to attribute this entire pandemic to one laboratory or to one city, that's different. But we have been very, very asympathetic towards animals in the long run. So we, as human beings, we should know how to make, strike a balance between our consumption and humane behavior. Anything and everything in nature doesn't belong to us. If that was the case, we shouldn't be crying over the death of individuals and humans today because we have never bothered about the death of so many other things. So this Corona period should make us realize how better how can we better our practices in society? So probably in a nutshell, yes, this period has been a wonderful uh, sabbatical for us to sit, think, to some extent realize, and in the future, realization alone may not help to act upon. So these, this is the way probably I can conclude my opening remarks. I know it was like a rigma role, but uh, still... Uh, it is. Yeah, you know, just a couple of things that struck me, uh, Dushyanji, from uh, what you were saying. Uh, one was uh, that, uh, why do you consider this period a sabbatical? Uh, should it not be actually the model for the way forward? As you said, uh, why can uh, this period not be 2.0 rather than a sabbatical before we get into 2.0? After all, what is it that we have not done that uh, it cannot be held to example, you know, uh, we work diligently from home, we have uh, lived with much less than we used to, we've uh, rediscovered how to be frugal, 
uh, we have rediscovered balance in our lives. Uh, we have rediscovered the value of family, of friends. There are so many things that uh, we have done, which actually we should now just make it a part of our lives. So I wanted to ask you, instead of a sabbatical, would you not consider this to be the model for the way forward? Uh, Kaveri, uh, you are right in a way when you say this is a period for us to think and act upon and not to relax. So that's what you say that don't call it a sabbatical yeah. where we've drawn, withdrawn ourselves. See, initially when it started on the March 24th till about the April end, it was like a sabbatical because we didn't know that there's going to be an enormity. We still thought that the numbers are going to reduce and we are going to flatten. But when we know that countries are suffering, even advanced economies are yeah. suffering, now we have realized. So it's been the journey from the lockdown of March 24th till now and how, how many other days it's going to extend. It's like this. So initially it was like a sabbatical in our minds. And then we started creating models for ourselves. And probably this discussion itself is a beautiful resultant of that model thinking. Yeah. So if it was a sabbatical, you're not going to call me and I'm not going to speak. But the initial days were like that. So it began like a sabbatical. And now I'm sure more than the Corona curve peaking, I think our model of thinking should peak yes. during yes. this period. Yeah. So you're right that way. Yeah. And the second point that struck me, you know, mm. uh, you uh, whenever we talk of India, especially, you know, we tend to veer from one extreme to the other, you know, in, in all our behaviors, in our ideologies. And uh, the yoga way of life is all about balance of mind, body, spirit. Why do we have to be taught this again and again when it is so intrinsic to our lives, you know? Uh, why, why have we not, why do we discover it when we're, say, 50 years old or 60 years old? Why is it not part of our value system from the get-go, part of our education system? Why is it that yoga is still seen as something that is a physical exercise, which of course it is, it is, but there is so much more. And why does it not become uh, this balance, which is so important, which we are now discovering? Why is it not a part of our lives? Uh, two quick examples, Kaveri. One, uh, as a student in my school days, uh, after coming home, if my grandparents would tell me this is the way of adding two numbers, this right. is the way of subtracting a number from the other, I would say, no, no, my teacher has taught me in a certain way. Right. So to as a student, at least in the early days of primary school, the teacher becomes the authority of dispensing knowledge, even if my grandparents were do post doctorates. And if my teacher was still an undergrad, my teacher is the source. Second, I have heard my grandparents say, see, in my childhood days, I never had the opportunity or I didn't make use of the opportunity of learning these scriptures and this way of our quintessential knowledge. I am giving this to you at a young age. They used to tell me, I'm giving this to you at a young age so that at this age where you can grasp things easily, you can do it. Now, what's happening to us is probably at the age of 40, 50, and 60, people through lectures, demonstrations, seminars, webinars have started realizing yeah. the essence of our heritage knowledge. But then to grasp, they either don't have their memory cells at the peak, one, yeah. or second, they have too many other things to engage them, their family, their livelihood, and right. so on. And when it's student days, probably our school system Honestly, this is my opinion. I'm not blaming the school system. It is not wholesome in nature. See, as much as I would like to learn about the value of pi, which is 22 by 7, what could have come from the Greek and the Western mathematicians, I would also like to understand the shloka which says, Chaturadika Shatam Ashtagunam Dva Ayushascha, which is 62,832 divided by 20,000, which gives you 3.1416, is what Aryabhatta tells in the 6th century. Right. So as a student, probably I should get the best of both worlds. I yeah. should be in aid to realize that the Western world has contributed as much as our Indian scholars. So if I'm going to learn the infinite series of integral calculus, I should also learn the Madhava series of the Sangamagrama School of Mathematics of Kerala. So I honestly feel if your question about why should we be taught again, why should that be reiterated again, I feel the education system has to be slightly tweaked. If I say it should be added, nothing has to be deleted, just addition. 
that little addition will help us create many many generations of realized souls rather than sitting on their heads in the age of 50 and 60 and telling them this is going to be no change then yeah absolutely i agree with you and and you know the children by the time have already grown up you have a new generation which knows even less than uh, the previous generation uh, over to you dr vedya yeah i just want to pick from where you left not that you know i would be doing it better than what dushyant said on the question of why for the individual when it should have been done at the early stages see the concept of value itself i recall swami dayanand saraswati uh, saraswati's definition of value itself a value is a value if the value of the value is valuable to oneself mm. so it becomes the individual who has to cherish and acknowledge the importance of what you say is valuable and it has to be perceived with the same value by another individual but the unfortunate part is it is within the same individual that the good and the bad resides so the amount of good or the amount of bad decides whether one is valuable or not valuable and that's how Uh, another uh, acharya explained how in these four yugas if you begin with the uh, first yuga the krita yuga where the good and the uh, evil were in two different worlds together devas and asuras and then following the uh, krita yuga after krita yuga the uh, uh, dwapar yuga there were also conflicts between the good and the bad but each of them were distinguished if you take for example in ramayana which was in the second yuga the good was in bharat the evil was in lanka and then in the uh, mahabharat it was in the same country but between two uh, families the good in the family of uh, pandavas while the bad in the uh, family of the kauravas but in the kali yuga alone you see it is in the same individual and hence uh, human uh, behavior is uh, evolutionary and there should be constant learning and understanding and that's precisely why you know our behavior is an evolutionary process and we keep learning things as we go by sure. now it's a good way to start this discussion and uh, dushyant has really touched two important uh, concepts he defined <clears throat> the new teacher in uh, vishwamitra and then the new mechanism of transmitting information and he is picked up uh, sanjaya so you have defined a new teacher a new way to transmit the information now as an education administrator myself i am concerned about how a new student has to be <laughs> you have a new teacher you have a new way to transmit information and the new student is belonging to gen y now this gen y i always say you no know, they are called gen y not because it is uh, y because they keep asking the question always why 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 so whatever we ask them to do they keep asking us why should we do it so the more and more rules you have in place the more and more you would like to break it and this corona has a very big uh, learning experience for us in terms of uh, how self discipline is very essential now uh, as an advice to me because i also teach students uh, now how do we ensure that this generation of students which is going to be the new student in a new environment understand this basic virtue of self discipline those days you had uh, you know vrtas and penans and people inculcated certain virtues through all of those instruments but now you know you cannot afford to do penans so what are the modern mechanisms by which this new student is also ethically conscious when we do an online assessment uh, students are outsmarting they know how to beat the system also so the value in a new student how can we make sure that we are able to transmit that without any transmission loss uh, uh vaidya i heard your question uh, i would like to answer it in two parts one uh, your your question was about how is the the uh, entire uh, game of self discipline going to permeate into every individual in your case as as a person who runs a very very esteemed university you will want your students to inculcate self discipline uh, uh, ramayana has a two step process one hanuman as a character see we have to realize uh, of course we have we have so much of adoration and love for hanuman that anything that's powerful anything that's uh, magnificent is hanuman in temples these days but let's look at hanuman as a person who is a self made individual 
he uh, out outshined his father and mother so he's probably he was the only monkey in his generation to have done a phd in grammar so he's called a navavyakarana pandita so he knew nine forms of grammar so he is a self made individual one thing about hanuman is he had so much of power prowess and knowledge that uh, uh, there is one anecdote which says that he was cursed not to know his very own power until and unless somebody reminds him of that so when somebody else reminds me of what my prowess or my talent is we in management parlance call it motivation so hanuman to fly to lanka so we can call it fly or we can even to use the right the technical term we can call that levitating so he levitated like a bird so he made his body so light and hollow that he could jump over from one place to the other so hanuman before he even took off from india from a place called mahindragiri which is tirukurungudi near tirunalveli in the south of india he was not aware that he had the ability to go to lanka until he had another person called jambavan who told him that you have the ability to fly right. so this was enough for hanuman to get all the uh, uh, lost power back and he could fly once he reaches lanka because his only mission was to search sita and the beauty about hanuman is he has never seen a human lady forget sita so his only aim identification was that she will be different from the general male and she will have a tail because the only woman he has seen is ruma and tara the wives of vali and sugriva so he hasn't had a profile pic of sita nothing before so he goes on to lanka seeing searching for sita room after room harem after harem at one point in time in valmiki's ramayana there is a juncture where hanuman says i'm going to commit suicide so he comes to a conclusion where he says that i'm going to commit suicide the person whom we adore revere and identify is saying that i'm going to commit suicide right. the very next second after he pre concludes that he's going to commit suicide then he thinks he thinks see if i am going to commit suicide one day or the other with the stink the foul probably we had a foul that came from ghatkopar and chandiveli yesterday so uh, uh, the foul smell that would emanate from my decaying body will make people realize and probably this information will reach india and the moment R- sugriva gets to know that his best advisor called as hanuman is dead he may also die of an attack when sugriva dies of an attack his closest mou friend memorandum of understanding <laughs> friend rama will also die so if rama dies lakshmana will die so there are about 20 verses in ramayana where hanuman thinks what will be the repercussions if i do this right. then what he does is he says i will motivate myself so he says that i will search sita now see the first step was he needed jambavan to motivate him second is where he motivated himself likewise self discipline to a very small extent can be taught by you or any other institution it is left to the individual to realize and practice it if the individual fails to realize even after these pandemic times we have to live with it he has to live with it and we have to live with such people in the society the society is not going to get idealistic in the days to come yeah. probably it may get topsy turvy but self discipline is absolutely a third person motivation and self motivation right. so what you're doing is a marvel please continue doing it towards the beneficiaries of your institution but don't even worry if that may not be permeating into them because that's their karma we leave it there so so i am not going to uh, have a course with a syllabus on self discipline <laughs> and then push it for a three credit course with exams and Correct. all of that stuff i will just make students realize its importance and then leave yeah. it as a third party uh, uh, intervening variable the the other part that you also touched uh, so beautifully in your opening remarks uh, is uh, that you cannot discard anything because it is new mm-hmm. nor can you ignore anything because it is old and mm-hmm. again we have a a covid experience on that where you know on one extreme we have modern science working very hard to come out with a vaccine on the other extreme we also have the ancient wisdom through our uh, siddha and ayurveda combinations also trying to come out with a prescriptive cure for uh, uh, covid and uh, both of them uh, both of these you know run on uh, parallel tracks and uh, both are necessary 
to ensure that this train of knowledge uh, keeps going in a balanced way. Now, moving forward, you know, uh, how do you think that uh, you know we have to realize the fact that both are necessary. Both need to coexist. There is as much as good in both. That somewhere, though the parallel tracks don't meet, the knowledge resources converge at some point, and we'll have to appreciate the convergence of modern science and ancient wisdom. Do you think that's possible? Uh, a question that has been uh, very beautifully coined and articulated by you. Before I could just answer this question, a kind of a disclaimer that I would like to state, because this answer requires this disclaimer. Uh, we as a society, I can't comment about a lot of other uh, 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 nationalities. I have had the opportunity to address a lot of countries and their nationalities, but pertaining to the nationality or the country where we live in with, uh, with our society, I can say that we have been infatuated with certain way of speaking and acting. Imagine if the same conversation were to be done in a language that you and I speak, for example, Tamil. Probably a set of students who go to the international schools and deemed and the very good universities may think just because it's in a regional language, these people will not be able to speak in English. So English has become a benchmark for us for anything which is right, scientific and sophisticated. One. And second thing is, we look at the external features. So suppose if I'm going to carry a mark on my forehead, like how you and I do, I will be conceived as a person who is absolutely religious, fundamentalist in nature, ready to pick up arms or fight or troll anybody. This is how people may think. But I will have a hundred questions on our own scriptures. They may not realize. So we have had a certain picture that we create out of people. Only if that goes, will we be able to appreciate modern science and medicine and ancient Ayurveda with equal poise. Because today, if a person says, Ayurveda says, take pepper powder, little curcumin lungasta, which is turmeric, little jeera, boil them with water and consume. And this will help you develop immunity. If my grandmother says this, Probably I have a misconception because she has not crossed her eighth standard. So I believe what she says is wrong. Whereas when the same thing comes from an ICMR of the best of the epidemiologists, see what they are saying. So our concept is not knowledge. We look at the knowledge giver. We start looking at who is dispensing that knowledge. Only if we unlearn the process of that will we be able to learn. So when I keep telling my audience or suggesting my audience to learn something good, we should learn how to unlearn what we have learned bad. So when there is so much of things that we have already clogged us minds with, it will not help. But nevertheless, an answer to your quick answer to your question. Ayurveda Siddha, how our government calls it as Ayush these days. So we have various modes of dispensing. Ultimately, we are looking to nature for solution, raw nature. So raw herbs, raw shrubs, raw plants, raw seeds, raw fruits. This is what we are looking at solution. Anything, we begin from Ayurveda till Siddha, all of these ancient modes of helping patients is largely preventive in nature. It is not to a large extent curative in nature. Suppose I have a Corona patient today. By giving him this concoction may not help him immediately, but it is preventive in nature. It may help, but largely preventive in nature. Modern science, leave alone the vaccines. Otherwise, if you look at modern science or modern medicine, it is more curative in nature. So they work on different fields, but we can touch both fields. As a person, till the corona arrives, I can still trust what Ayurveda says, still continue using black pepper. I can continue using jeera. I can continue using turmeric. I can let them boil, have it with honey, nothing wrong. So that's preventive. Suppose I get Corona, I can still go to my doctor and get one of probably if it's a, if, if it is recommended to take hydroxychloroquine or if it's tell me, sir, or whatever is the drug, the generic or the specific drug I can take. So I should learn how to appreciate because one comes from a different level of playing field called preventive. The other comes from curative. 
even if it is vaccines which are generally taught to us as being preventive in nature we will be any prudent a uh, very very careful doctor will always say i have given you the vaccine for typhoid it doesn't mean you will never get typhoid every doctor will say that you may still get typhoid but it may not be with a high intensity so probably modern medicine and ancient medicine which we akin to ayurveda and siddha should be treated with equal poise nothing should be disregarded at the same time if time being the doctor says take this medicine i should take and until if corona affects us there is absolutely no harm in following following some recommended concoctions for corona so i feel it's one's uh, attitude towards learning and accepting new things like that may i just ask one question here yeah. this country oh sure you know, you know uh, uh, one of the things that struck us uh, during the lockdown and a lot of people commented on it was the discipline with which most people adhered to it by and large we as a mm. society showed some mm. remarkable discipline which mm. we are not particularly known for mm. uh, would you agree with that and how do you assess that uh, is that something ingrained in us because we don't normally show that level of discipline do we yeah uh, and i have a firm belief that uh, in the months to come we will still not continue showing that discipline <laughs> uh, because uh, discipline is something that is a quality that should come from within us right with the due regard to discipline not right. to our life right. see i feel whatever steps we take with social distancing and not spitting and maintaining distances all this is with the absolute fear that what if corona comes to me right my life matters a lot actually it may not to a large extent but still i have an opinion that my mat- yeah. my life matters a lot to this world and what will happen to the entire ecosystem of this world if i die everything will stop and completely indispensable <laughs> so this is the thought that i have so i feel the discipline that we are seeing today in the society may seem good but that's absolutely an illusionary or a superficial layer of that we are seeing it's not coming out of to a large extent maybe to some extent it could have changed right. in some but it is coming out of fear for survival and life yeah. right. uh, i feel if if oh, if and only when a person realizes that uh, let's assume this uh, the corona f- curve is going to get flattened right should the person stop spitting on the ground or not right simple yeah so that should still continue see yeah. my value for nature is immaterial of whether this corona or no corona right so only if these practices continue with us or within us towards our society even after we have flattened the curve of corona can we say that as a society we have matured right. to an extent otherwise i feel it's absolutely the fear for survival and not discipline at all just mm. an additional question sorry uh, you know you talked about karma and everybody of mm. course has their own karma yet mm. india and indians tend to be so judgmental you mm. know we think that that person is bad or that person is good mm. but actually he or she is just following his own karma you know that mm. that may be that person's karma to be like that true so we why have we become so judgmental do we know this intrinsically yet we have become so judgmental of each other see uh, today uh, uh, we say that we as indians who have followed this indian civilization have believed in karma and why do we do this my honest opinion is we are not doing in anything much to empower ourselves with that knowledge right. being in india or being in chennai or being in bangalore doesn't mean i'm harnessing that knowledge hmm. knowledge is in the air i am not making use of it see how many of us even try to look at books that speak about the ancient practices how should my approach to myself and to a person like kaveri be so everything goes on uh, misconceptions and prejudices so i feel I, living in a country or living in a subcontinent doesn't mean i naturally inherit that knowledge unless and until i take efforts to get that knowledge point number 1 mm. and point number 2 uh, 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 as a civilization and largely as sanatana dharma and the inbuilt different philosophies like advaita visishta advaita dvaita beda veda achintya beda veda which is dualism qualified non dualism and we have theologies like vaishnavism shaivism shaktism and so on all these have wonderful scriptures and wonderful practitioners and each of these however different they are in their tenets they have all addressed an individual we should remember 
Sanatana Dharma addresses an individual. It doesn't address the society because it believes that if Kaveri as an individual changes, if Vaidya as an individual changes, if Dushyant as an individual changes, where is the need for me to address the society? Because we three make the society. So it is the individual's efforts to harness knowledge, realize and work upon it. So I feel in the last few years, our uh, attention has been grabbed upon certain other things. I wouldn't call them detrimental, but certain irrelevant, unwarranted things that may have taken us from the knowledge of the past. Because India as a subcontinent, as a civilization, has never been judgmental of any religion, any community, any caste. Had it been the case, we wouldn't have the oldest mosque in India of the 7th century. Right. We wouldn't have the Jews taking asylum in India. We wouldn't have the uh, Israeli constitution thanking India for having been very considerate and benevolent towards the Jews. Okay. We wouldn't have uh, Buddhism. Buddhism and Hinduism, remember in tenets, we are deadly opposite each other. Okay. But today we've gotten so friendly that we accept Buddha who propagated that religion as one of the incarnations of Vishnu. Okay. So Arkaha, Vajasanihi, Shringi, Jayantaha, Sarva Vijayi, these are the names that come in Vishnu Sahasranama that denote Buddha. And Mahavira, whom uh, Jainism appreciates, and Jainism and Hinduism are absolutely diametrically opposite. Okay. But today, if I visit a Belur and a Halebid temple of the Hoysala architecture in Karnataka, I make it a point to visit the Gomateshwara and Shravana Belagola, who belongs to Mahavira uh, period. So, uh, as a subcontinent, we, we uh, probably I can put it this way. There is no other step that we can take to get more inclusive than this. Hmm. Probably we as practitioners of Sanatana Dharma should continue realizing that we belong to a very inclusive civilization. At the same time, all other religions should also realize that Hinduism has been very inclusive and we should also be equally reciprocative and appreciative of Hinduism. See, there is I, there has always been a question that people have asked me uh, in interviews. Do you feel we should show tolerance? I say we should not show tolerance. We should show mutual respect. respect. Right. Why should I tolerate See, I don't have to tolerate Kaveri. I respect Kaveri. Right. See, it's mutual respect. This tolerance word should be squeezed and scrapped. We don't <laughs> need tolerance. We need mutual respect. respect. Every individual should respect each other. So nicely put up. Um, my next question is again, uh, you see this period we have, uh, we have seen followers of different faith, uh, yeah. you know, internalizing their mode of uh, worship. Uh, we, we saw uh, uh, major uh, events happening through this lockdown period. Mm -hmm. uh, that makes us to also ask this question and also on my, my personal experience, you know, yeah. my father aged relatives not being able to go to temples, but then we have found out new ways of reaching out to God. My, my kids have found new ways to learn new things uh, in praise of the Lord and all of that. Uh, and since you rightly said Sanatana Dharma addresses the individual. Now, during this time, how much do you think uh, that internalization process uh, will help us in also understanding newer ways to reach to the Almighty, the Supreme? Has this given us new opportunities uh, to worship the Lord in different forms? Are there any evidences to prove from the ancient scriptures that God can be reached in different forms. So if that's the case, uh, the way in which just as education, the way in which knowledge is getting transacted is changing. How are we as uh, somebody who'd love to always go to temples, we definitely would want to go to temples again. But how is the future behavior of individuals going to get characterized when it comes to reaching out to God do you do you have any piece of advice to us? Okay, uh, Vaidya, uh, uh, just uh, one or two uh, pieces of information that I would like to share about general temple worship. When I say temples, uh, I have absolutely equal respect towards other uh, right. uh, uh, right. places of uh, worship, be it the church or the mosque. Though I may not visit them often. I have equal respect for their followers. Now coming to temples where my piece of research and practices. Temples were first of all constructed from the 6th 
the earliest temples we know of probably from the 1st 2nd century 6th century during the pallava period gupta period mauryan period and then we come to the chola pallava hoysala rashtrakuta chalukya kakatiya period temples were never meant as places of worship temples were meant as a congregation of various cultural activities so if you wanted to attend a dance concert it was in a temple so there was a mandapa constructed for a dance recital if you wanted to attend to a, uh, the music concert it used to happen in a temple if you wanted the priests who have practiced vedic hymns for years together sit and recite vedam together it was in temples so if you wanted food to be offered to god it used to be made in the temple kitchens used to be offered to god and then shared among devotees so temple was a place of bustling activities that is why most or probably all our temples that we know that have survived till date were constructed of stone in some form of the other it could be hard rock soft stone soap stone and so on but kings and commoners never constructed their houses in stone you don't you have the temple of brihadeeshwara temple in tanjavur a unesco monument to which shastra has the proud uh, association of that beautiful ancient city brihadeeshwara temple which has survived over a thousand years is made of hard granite but where is Ra- the k- k- the king's palace we don't know raja raja chola's palace we don't know where is rajendra chola's palace we don't know because the king and the commoners always constructed houses out of perishable materials like brick timber and so on but they wanted the places of artful congregation like temples to survive for generations so for us temples are never meant for worship but today sadly most paper articles they say temples are open for worship because in the last 100 years the only thing that we feel that temples do is only worship see uh, i remember a quote from one of the commentaries to tiruvaimuri tiruvaimuri is the essence uh, kaveri may be able to appreciate because uh, most part of india will uh, uh, follows the tamil uh, the sanskrit veda like tamil nadu but tamil also having had the proud lineage of being one of the very very old languages has the association of a saint called nammalvar called shatakopa and he gave a work called tiruvaimuri which is the essence of samaveda of sanskrit so to that work which has been given maybe years thousands of years back we have had commentaries a commentary 900 years before probably of the 10th and the 11th century the commentator makes a beautiful remark he says he says that when we enter temple what, what is our uh, uh, outlook towards the temple he says pirar kovilukkul nulaindal kovil is srirangam kovilukkul nulaindal if people get inside the temple kudirai ottam oduma pole oduvar like horses that have been left out of the stable that they will keep running towards the sanctum sanctorum have a glimpse a darshan of the lord and return whereas the commentator continues anan bhattarum narayur nambiyum thunai patrashaga kolvar there were two people whom he uh, illustrates one is parashara bhatta and second is narayur nambi he says they are people even before going to the sanctum sanctorum they will embrace every pillar which is a piece of art so even 900 years before there was a section of society that thought temples were only meant for worship they never appreciated nature they never appreciated the architecture but we had one small population then which used to appreciate the temples architecture so our motto towards temples should not be towards worship nevertheless to your question has this corona period taught us uh, uh, the lesson as a civilization i can proudly say kaveri can proudly vouch and you can say we have very strongly believed that god is everywhere simple there ends the point so that sarvagnyatvam sarvavyapyatvam and sarvashaktitvam omniscient omnipresent omnipotent has been completely realized the anecdote of prahlada saying that god is everywhere sarvatra asti tada asti and then god coming out as a man lion out of the pillar is a blatant and a glittering example of the omniscience of the lord but the moment i say this there are many many complicated questions that come when i go to my washroom and sit on the commode is god in the commode mm-hmm. first question because i am sure people are going to ask me this question one if god is everywhere is god present inside the corona virus because if we say god is present everywhere 
ideally he must be present inside the pathogen virus if we say yes then the problem is how can god who is present in the virus cause so much of agony so these are the questions that come that is where there is a very concluding remark made by our shastras god is present everywhere no doubt underlying but he is untouched by the characteristics of that object that's very very clear suppose he is present inside vaidya and vaidya has 10 vices those vices will not affect him he is there within you but remains untouched he is within the corona but the evil aspect of corona is something that is not attributed to him just like how i may consume a sweet let's assume the kalakand or the tirunelveli halwa of the south that is so sticky it sticks to my hands it sticks to my legs it sticks on my lips but it doesn't stick to my tongue so like how it remains untouched with the greasiness of the halwa god is present everywhere but remains untouched by the blemishes of that object so this corona period has of course given us the knowledge that god is present everywhere so even sitting at home i can do my namaz sitting at home i can do, offer my mark matthew luke and john from the new testament i can sit at home and recite tevaram and trivasagam and vishnu sahasranamam no doubt but as a civilization we have built temples not to demean this concept but we have always believed temples have been a places of artful congregations so my opinion is after the corona period when things start slowly returning to normalcy i will want to come to tanjavur and visit brihadeshwara temple at the same time that is not to defy the fact that god is not everywhere he is still in my house as much as he is in brihadeshwara temple so this uh-huh. corona period yeah. is a realization um uh, of course he, uh, you know uh, dushyanti must have been asked this 500000 times but uh, this is something that i always feel uh, very strongly about uh, how does god tell us to handle suffering we know that there is suffering we know that there's so much pain and uh, we've seen it during this corona virus especially uh, we see so much agony on the streets and even amongst ourselves how do we best handle this agony both within us and outside us the suffering uh the i'm neither going to give a solution nor a justification yeah. but as you've rightly said this is a question time and again people have asked me and i have also asked the teachers who have dispensed knowledge to me right so whether the answer sounds convincing enough or not at times the answer could be so brutally uh uh truthful that it may seem uh, as uh, uh unmerciful like the merchant of venice where a pound of flesh closest to the heart without yeah. a drop of blood was asked yeah. so with all these disclaimers i would just like to say your question was with so much of suffering was around right hinduism sanatana dharma has a very clear statement it says only through sufferings you can wash away your sins right so in fact our predecessors who have been our icons like adi shankara ramanuja madhvacharya vedanta deshika and many many people who have lived in the uh, across the country they have one thing to say which is when sufferings come to us it seems we should welcome them yeah see it seems so impractical and so uh, as asympathetic see right. probably if, uh, to a migrant worker today who doesn't know how to go from one place to the other and yeah. i say see welcome the suffering yeah. he is not going to like me and my statement yeah. but probably when the same person gets a piece of meal from some good because this this period kaveri i'm going to tell you b- beyond a lot of other things it has brought us together as a wonderful yeah. society yeah see uh, uh, when rama had left ayodhya along with sita he was an aristocrat he was the uh, uh, platinum spooned child of dasharatha and when he comes to forest he makes friends with guha who has never had the habit of bathing right. he makes friends with sugriva who is a monkey he makes friends with vibhishana who is the estranged brother of ravana so this was he didn't look at the financial status he didn't look at the caste he didn't look at their practices so in times of distress the society comes together and we should be hopeful it stays together so that is a very wonderful thing that we have done but the point is if i tell a migrant worker now welcome suffering he's not going to do that 
but probably 2 3 months later when i visit the same migrant worker and i kind of talk to him he will say see now i was getting food for last 2 years and those 10 days were enough for my family to realize how important is the value of saving kaveri yeah. see uh, not that migrant workers don't get that extra 10 rupees to save if you look at the alcoholic uh, conditions of families in our country they earn that very night they drink and there is atrocities meted in the family right. probably had they saved that 10 rupees every day for 350 days 3500 would have got saved yeah. this will surely dawn in a lot of people's mind okay. so suffering is absolutely an opportunity to realize you know there's a great poetic statement which says the sweetest of the poems come from the saddest of the thoughts yeah ramayana would wouldn't have been this sweet had rama and sita not been separated yeah so this season of sufferings beat see i'm i'm not talking only about the migrant workers even the middle class families are affected oh. even the aristocrats are affected yeah. why should we talk only about one section everybody is affected and it has a lesson for every strata trust me so this is a learning process so if your question was uh, why should god make us suffer it is not god making us suffer it is our actions which are the cause my question was not why does god make us suffer and understand oh. that my question mm. was how do we handle it oh. okay uh, handling at the time being is to get our piece of meal if i'm going right. to talk about the migrant workers right. if i'm going to give them that that meal for that day that's going to help them yeah and over a period of time if they find employment opportunities that is going to come but beyond this as a society i feel probably a, a motivation speaker like me there are many 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 wonderful speakers and great speakers we should all get together and probably find some two or three minutes of talks capsule talks which reaches even the migrant workers to make them feel good see today if my talks have to reach it reaches a vaidya it reaches vaidya's family it reaches kaveri kaveri's family they are important to me but if my talks and my wordings in such a way that it makes it simple for a migrant worker to understand why should they be deprived of such motivation ways they are never exposed to motivation the all that they have to look for is today i get my meal tomorrow i have to work motivating them and giving them a lot of positive values i think a lot of we the spiritual speakers should come out and create some content for them to make them feel good that feel good factor if it gets into the lower strata of the society probably as a society we will get uh, like how bhutan says we don't calculate gdp we right. go on the happiness quotient yeah. probably that's the way ahead we should realize how happy we are yeah vedya yeah i mean uh, i think uh, dushyant has actually uh, led us to the last part now if that has to happen the mm. feel good factor has to happen i want to relate that with the atmanirbhar bharat yeah so many of us you know it is like a sankalpa for self reliance mm. and i have heard you on many occasions in the past and i want to hear you again on the significance of sankalpa as a concept you know relating time and space and i would request you to use this opportunity to engage in a samashti sankalpa because we are now in the interest of well being for all of us all of humanity and the nature can you please engage in a samashti sankalpa for a global well being through realizing india's self reliance the power of indian self reliance so that's the last part that i place before you Uh, uh sorry i just like to intervene here this shanji vaidya ji mm. as you know that i will be leaving at uh, 6:15 Uh, mm. So please don't uh, think that I'm being very rude, Dushanji. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. My pleasure, Kaveri. And I think uh, the answer to this question is uh, going to be very succinct and clear in that time period okay. given because. So, uh, yeah. that, But yeah. I, so do, I didn't want to use at all. I did want to use this opportunity to thank you so much. I think it was a most wonderful, wonderful exposition of so many different ideas uh, which you put forward so well. thanks to you and vaidya for that yeah uh, very quickly uh, atmanirbhar bharat of course uh, shri narendra modi ji uh, has made this uh, a sankalpam which means to say collective will power that we all think about self reliant country there are a variety of things that people are talking about to boycott a certain country to boycott a certain the goods of certain country that's different and that's going to be to some extent on a political level 
but when i'm talking about as a indic speaker and a traveler uh when i go to switzerland of course switzerland is known for its beautiful contours and those beautiful ranges even people living in switzerland they say see we as a country when we are tourism dependent we are not dependent on the inland population because the population of switzerland is so little that even if they visit twice or thrice they will not get those revenues so it's the revenues of the other europeans the asians the americans who visit switzerland that's going to add revenue to the switzerland economy or the tourism industry in india we don't when i say i say we don't it essentially means that the domestic population is so very high that even if kaveri visits mahabalipuram and she takes four people along vaidya takes four people to tanjavur i'm sure our tourism industry is going to face the best of the times so now people are worried oh the international fights have been begun so how will i visit phuket and siam reap in cambodia that's not my problem my problem is i have to visit the beautiful hills of tripura i have to visit the beautiful temples of puri and jagannath so our land is infested with architectural marvels so if atmanirbhar bharat has to begin probably you can say we need manufacturing facilities of 10000 cell phones all that is there the easiest thing that we can do is visit the closest archaeological spot if we start doing that india has 1.4 billion population three and a half times or four, even four times that of us and we start visiting look at the amount of value we are going to add to our places so my thought for atmanirbhar bharat is simply appreciating the contours of our own country not to depreciate any other country but to appreciate our country and very quickly to the sankalpa uh, space and time space is akasham anything that's open is space akasham for us and in sanskrit there is a term ghata akasham ghatam is pot space within a pot is referred to as a space of the pot it's called ghata akasham so space is the place where we live in probably you may be living in chennai i could be living in bangalore now that is space time so we are in 2020 a lot of them say don't even say the word 2020 that's <laughs> <laughs> so we are caught between 2019 and 21 if i can make it technically correct <laughs> so we are in a certain time period so this time period and space is the resultant of we inheriting this from our past so to probably put that in a graph of space and time is where we have this concept called sankalpa in sanskrit so it goes like this we start with who is the creator we say adya brahmana the the one who has taken the efforts to put all these beautiful pieces of nature together that brahma adya brahmana and that brahma has a period of 100 years so the first 50 and second 50 so in the current brahma's second 50th year we are there dvitiya parardhe in the second 50th year and in those 50 years every year of brahma has the same number of days 365 days whatever we talk about it has the same number of days but the length of that day varies what happens is we have the 60 seconds that make a minute 60 minutes that make an hour 24 hours that make a complete day so 365 such days make one year 432000 such years make kali yuga twice that which is 864000 years makes dwapara Three times that is treta. Four times that is krita. So four plus three plus two plus one, which is ten, into four lakh thirty-two thousand years. Forty-three lakh twenty thousand years is a term called as chatur yugam. Four yugas together is called chatur yugam. That is forty-three lakh twenty thousand years. Thousands of chatur yugams make the daytime for Brahma. Thousands of chatur yugams make the night for Brahma. So two thousand such periods make it the entire day for him. likewise there should be 365 days and likewise there should be 100 years for him so there we say dvitiya parardhe shweta varaha kalpe vaivasvata manvantari the entire period of 1000 manvantaras is ruled by 14 supervisors we are in the seventh supervisor who is the sun called vivaswan so in that 71 chatur yugas we are in the 28th chatur yuga ashta vimshati tame and in that chatur yuga we are in the kali yuga in kali yuga we have crossed the Uh, we are in the first quarter so we are in the 1 lakh 8000th quarter of which 5000 years are gone so we say kali yuge prathame paade jambu dweepe bharata varshe bharata khande meroho dakshine paashve meru is a mountain that we take as a benchmark meru is generally regarded as the pamir hills uh, around the karakoram range 
north of Kashmir and Pakistan and Afghanistan. So we are south of that. So we say, Meroho Dakshine Parshwe. Then we pray to the Almighty that I am now located in this space and time. Please give peace to this society, to this world, sans any discrimination of religion, caste, community, belief, and let there be peace restored through this beautiful uh, conversation arranged by Kaveri and Vaidya. Mm -hmm. And uh, thanks to the New Indian Express Group and Shastra for uh, having uh, brought this discussion together. And let there be peace over a period of time in the minds of people who have been agonized to a large extent. Yeah. And I'm sure this discussion is going to kind of at least motivate to some extent a listener, whoever is going to listen or going to watch this episode. Yeah. Thank you so much. Vedya, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm done. I'm just going to uh, thank uh, Dushyant as well as Kaveri and the New Indian Express group for uh, putting together such a wonderful program. This uh, program title Expressions as clearly expressed in a very, very nice way. Yeah. And finally concluded with a very uh, touching message that calls for a peace for the global well-being. And I'm sure we are all going to bounce back, bounce back stronger. So thank you very much, uh, Dushan Sridhar, for your time. Thank, and thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you. Namaste.